Welcome to the YouTube channel of Desert Ridge Baptist Church in St. George, Utah. I'm Michael Waldrop, one of the pastors here at DRBC. We strive for sound doctrine in preaching and teaching and warm fellowship around biblical truth. For more info about DRBC, please visit our website, drbc.us. There you can find helpful links as well as a secure means for contributing financially to our ministry here in this area. Soli Deo Gloria. I invite you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, that song says, All other ground is sinking sand. If what you're pursuing is a comfortable income, steady work, reasonable leisure activities, <clears throat> the truth of that song may be hidden to you. But if you understand you're accountable to the God of creation who is perfect and is the standard of all justice and what's right and will hold you accountable, then it becomes very clear that Christ is the solid rock and all other ground is sinking sand. And even though there may be some value and some comfort and some distraction and convenience about, uh, about our lives when we when we have that kind of American middle of, middle of the road uh, uh, lifestyle, please know that that is not forever. This life is not forever, and so we need to think about the future. Today, I'll be preaching from First Corinthians six nine through eleven. Lost and found, future reality, the unrighteous and the justified. I saw. Uh, a tweet from some preacher or pastor and his topic for the poll was preachers do you give titles to your sermons and here's why I do because I if somebody says well what is your sermon about if I can't answer that in a few seconds if I don't know enough to say well here's what it's about it's about the lost and those that are found and the implications for that, for future reality, for the unrighteous and the justified or the declared righteous. See, that's, that title is a check for me to see, do I know what I'm about to tell you? And so that's, that's why that's the title. We're going to be looking at two categories in these next three verses. Those who are lost, called in verse 9, the unrighteous, and then verse 11 describes those who are found and the word justified is even used there. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, you know that this was, if you were here last week, a part of the, the end of um, what we read there. Paul is going through and he's dealing with problems in the Corinthian church, a church that he himself had founded during his second missionary journey as recorded in Acts chapter 18. Uh, in the year AD 59 to 51, that was his ministry there. And now we're in about AD 55 as he writes from Ephesus to the Corinthians. And he has heard both from interaction, it's an exchange of letters, it appears, uh, and from reports from, among others, maybe Chloe's people we see in chapter 1. He understands what's going on in Corinth and, and he's writing them this letter and this is an issue now it, it appears because of chapter 7 verse 1 now the now concerning the matters about which you wrote that starting in chapter 7 he starts answering their questions when they recognize they had some problems but in the first six chapters we're dealing with things that, that are going on and they may not know their problems, but they are problems and Paul wants to deal with them. So, so that's what we have happening. And in verse, verses 1 to 8 of chapter 6, Paul is dealing with the unthinkable reality that believers are having disputes 
and they're going to pagan, secular courts who have no basis of right and wrong to settle their issues. And the, the problem is that this is a terrible witness to the power of God. It's a, it's a false witness to the power of God, and it ought not to be happening. And what it reveals is a wrong set of priorities. So let's think about this passage 9 through 11 because this really uh, makes clear for us the division, the contrast between the unrighteous and the declared righteous. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. So the two categories are the unrighteous and those who have been declared righteous on the basis of Jesus. God's grace is the only way that a fallen sinner can be righteous. So the Bible divides people into two groups, lost and saved, or lost and found. Unrighteous and declared righteous, or made righteous. Of God and of this world, or of the devil. Not God's people, God's people. People are identified as either belonging to God or not, loving God or not. Bought by the Messiah or not. Those who are saved, they have the standing before God as being righteous. A standing that is not earned by them, but is imputed, that is counted or reckoned to them based on the substitutionary person and work of Jesus the Messiah. Those who are lost, they have the standing according to them by pristine, accurate, perfect clinically precise justice. And so they are condemned as traitorous rebels against their creator and sustainer. All humans since Adam, except the Lord Jesus, the God-man, the divine Messiah, begin in the category of unrighteous in themselves. By God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the saved are declared righteous and redeemed and reconciled to God, to the glory of God alone. This is the basic message of Christianity. If you don't understand that sentence that I just said, study, pray, ask God to help you to understand that. Listen again. By God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the saved are declared righteous and redeemed and reconciled to God, to the glory of God alone. And when we say in Christ, we mean faith in his person. He is God in human flesh and his work, his death, burial, resurrection, and perfect righteousness on our behalf. Now, in addressing the inappropriate sinful behavior among those who had been redeemed, and by the way, he was addressing sinful behavior among those who were professing to be redeemed. I want you to notice something here. In verse 8, look what he says. You yourselves wrong and defraud. That word wrong is a verb there. You, you are wronging each other. Uh, in the Greek, it is adikaite, which means you are unrighteousnessing each other. You are acting without righteousness. You are doing the opposite of what's right, and therefore we have this word called wrong. It's the opposite, opposite of what's right. You are wronging. But look what he says in verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That word is adikoi. It's just a noun form meaning the wrongers. It's a play on words, and he wants them to see this. You're wronging one another, and the people who wrong one another will not inherit the kingdom of, of God. It's harder to see in English, but that's clear in the, in the rain, language that he wrote, Greek. So Paul was writing and addressing this inappropriate sinful behavior among those who had been redeemed, and he counted them as saved people. He addressed them as saved people over and over and over and over throughout the first six chapters. He makes references to them being called, to them in the fellowship of his son. He calls them brothers, um, those who are saved, who are being saved, who are called, who believe, who are brothers. And I'm just going down looking at my highlights of how he addresses them. Uh, the mature, uh, those who are spiritual. Uh, now, he does say, but you're infants in Christ. But he says you're in Christ. 
So he's dealing with people who are acting a way uh, in a way that's not appropriate to who they are, or at least who they're professing to be. So Paul reminded the Corinthian believers of the contrast between the unrighteous and their behavior and the saved, whom he called washed, sanctified, and justified in verse 11, which was accomplished in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God there in verse 11. Uh, before we go further, let's read these three verses together. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Keep in mind that he's just said, you are wronging, you are acting unrighteous. And then he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Couldn't have a more sharp, sharply delineated contrast here between the unrighteous and the justified, the unrighteous and those who are declared righteous. And he, he gives some help he gives some behavior. Now that last verse, verse 11, this, this sermon is going to be a two-part series, at least two. The latter part will focus on verse 11. And that's really good news. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now that... That is a celebration verse. But I want you to know that we're going to celebrate more when we understand the filth from which we were cleaned up. And even though he says some of you were like this, not all had participated in those particular sins, but every saved person is a former lost person characterized by this kind of, of spiritual existence. So we're going to be looking, first of all, at the future and behavior of the unrighteous and then uh, the future, the glorious future and status, uh, mostly the status and the future that is because of that status of those who are declared righteous. Now i got to tell you, this is not worth doing unless we look and see what the Word of God says. And there's not much to say except buckle your seatbelt. This list and many other lists and descriptions of evil in the Bible expose human nature for who we are in the flesh. It is very countercultural. We will not win network awards for reviewing and affirming what we're going to be looking at over the next few minutes. But Jesus always told the truth. God tells the truth. And so in his relationship with Israel, he gave them the law because they needed to know that it's wrong not to kill each other. It's wrong to kill each other. It is wrong. He had to put it, he put that in a code, in a written law. And so we have given here a description of right and wrong. But we got to keep verse 11 in mind, okay? If I make reference to it throughout the sermon, we got to get to that because if we don't have that at the end, this is the most depressing. Uh, thing to study that you could possibly study the depravity of humanity uh, examples are everywhere and we could tell story after story of horrendous vile wicked filthy sin and evil but praise God but you were washed 
You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So that's where we're heading. That's the good news, but we got to see the bad news first. Got to see the bad news first. Now, that, that verse, though, Gordon Fee wrote an 845-page commentary on 1 Corinthians. But in that commentary, he said, one of the most important theological statements in the epistle of verse 11. And he's right. Of course it is. It's not only important, it's freeing. It's, a, it's deliverance. It describes our deliverance. So praise God for that. So this reminder of who the unrighteous are and what their future is, and it's inappropriate to act like them and save people, it was necessary because that's what was happening. It's a necessary reminder not only for first, first century Corinthians, but for all who desire to live for the glory of God. So that's the key. That's, that's what will make the difference whether that's, this has impact for you or not. You either desire to live for the glory of, of God or not. You're either... Uh, taking up some time with a religious activity, or you want to know what does God say? If you want to know what God says, then you're in the right place because we're going to look into His Word. Our society is not the place to look. Our society has not only blurred the lines between what is sinful and what is okay, but they've switched the categories in many cases, like, for example, in the definition of marriage, on the issue of abortion, etc. Isaiah 5.20. Isaiah 5.20 is important. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In order to avoid this kind of selfish, idolatrous treason against our Creator and our Savior, it is necessary for us to understand what God says is evil. If you want to honor him by doing what's right, you need to know what he says is right. If you want to honor him by not doing what is wrong, you need to know what he says is wrong. If you don't know what he says is right and wrong, you have no hope of honoring him by doing what's right and not doing what's wrong. And the solution is absolutely not to redefine what's right and what's wrong, which is going on, it's rampant, and it's inevitable given the thinking that empowers the individual to decide based on preferences and, and, and really the individual becomes God, the standard of judgment to say, what seems right and fair to me? We live in a time and a place because of the ease of our living, uh, because we, we don't face many of the challenges that others have, that that thought is rampant. Whatever you want, whatever you decide, whatever feels right to you, you have to be true to yourself. Never mind the fact that you are alive and you're going to die and perish and there's nothing you can do about it. Never mind the fact that there, you're here somehow. Who put you here? Somebody put you here. Maybe you're accountable to somebody and the whole history of the human race shows an effort by every culture everywhere to say we're accountable to somebody. We've got to do something to appease somebody somewhere this is not just us and we live and we die and that's it. The whole human experience in history has said we're not that. And yet, and yet, our culture today wants to hold on to that idea and say we're spiritual people. We are spiritual, authentic people. But here's what's right and wrong. What's right is what's right for me. And what's true is what's true for me. And I don't have to adjust my understanding of right and wrong to somebody who's above me. That is the message that every one of us in this room is getting constantly from our society. And it is absolutely antithetical to the message of Scripture, which is warning us there is a God and you are not God. You will answer to God. Woe to those who call evil good. You want to say, well... Those, you know, that law, that's, it's kind of old-fashioned. Here's what God says to you. Woe to you. You may leave from here and go down and buy a milkshake and dismiss it. But what's happening is that woe and all that is connected with that woe is being stored up 
And one day it will be poured out in pristine clinical justice, right and pure and good and eternally destructive for the enemies of God. God does not mince words when he describes what is right and wrong. This was a late edition, guys, so I don't have the slide for this. So if you want to write this one down, this, this is one you need to just read often to understand the standard of right and wrong and what God thinks about what is wrong. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, there are six things that Yahweh hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Now that six, seven thing is just a kind of a Hebraic expression. Uh, you say the number and then to emphasize it, you, you, you tell the real number then. There are six things. There are seven things that he hates. And here they are. Haughty eyes. Is that where you would start? The list of things that Michael Waldrop hates when I think of vile, wicked things. Where would you start? First thing we're told is haughty eyes. That's an attitude, isn't it? A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. It's interesting that it's phrased that way. Unborn babies, I don't know that you can be in a category of innocent blood any more than unborn babies. Not innocent ultimately, but relatively compared to those hands that are killing. How does God feel about it? He, he hates it. It's an abomination to him. A heart that devises wicked plans. You say, well, I would never do that. I'm not a terrorist or making a diagram of some building to go in and blow up. No, but have you ever thought, well, I don't know if that's right or not. But I can always ask forgiveness after the fact. Have you ever thought that? That's devising wicked plans, isn't it? Feet that make haste to run to evil. A false witness who breathes out lies. That's similar to a lying tongue, but this one's more specific. And one who sows discord among brothers. It says God hates it. It's an abomination to him. It means he loathes it, makes him nauseous. It is an offense to him. It is, it is insulting personally to him. It is spitting in his face. It is to commit those sins is the most specific intentional act of war that you can take against God. He hates it. It's an abomination to him. Those, those things. It's not just those things though. We've got a whole book here. One section of the book is called the law. The law establishing right and wrong. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. 4,000 years may have passed in human history, but I want to tell you something. Our God is unchanging. And because what is good is based on Him and His character and He defines it, what is good and what is evil, those two categories have never changed, no matter how sophisticated and philosophical and authentic our society might become. So if we want to avoid treason against our Creator, doing things that insult Him, then we need to know what He says is good and what He says is evil, and that's what we're doing today. Our passage today helps us to understand what God defines as evil behavior. This helps us to see the sinfulness of our fallen flesh and then thus to understand our need of a gracious Savior. This helps us to understand how we are to separate from evil behavior as witnesses to the cleansing, purifying, redemptive power of God in our lives by grace through faith in Christ. Let us understand and be diligent to stand against evil in both our faith and our practice. 
Remember that but right there in verse 11. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. There's a contrast, and there ought to be a difference in the way we act. So the first part, the future and the behavior of the unrighteous. First thing we need to see here is that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, inheriting the kingdom is a future event, and there are people who will inherit it and people who will not. And we'll talk more about those that will inherit it in the second part, uh, Lord willing. But I do remember hearing President Clinton in discussing a verse from 1 Corinthians. He, he said in verses 9 and 10, well, this is what, this is what God said in verses 9 and 10. As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. That's a quote of Isaiah 64, 4. The next verse says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. But he said, No, what no eye, no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what we can do when we work together. And that's Tower of Babel thinking. This says God has revealed us these things that have forever been here. He's talking about the gospel here. He's talking about the work, the gospel, and the all the all the accomplishments that get us in the kingdom and in the eternal state forever. But the unrighteous will not inherit it. The unrighteous will not inherit. They do not have it coming. Do you know why we are joint heirs with Christ as described in Romans 8? Why we are heirs together with Him? Because when God surveys everything, which He doesn't have to think in order to do, by the way, He, he knows everything. Do you know that He sees one from the human arena that is worthy of the kingdom, who is worthy of of the highest name possible. He's worthy that all the others bow their knee and call him Kurios or Lord. He's worthy of that. He's the only one that's worthy. And he has it coming. He's the only one who has it coming. All the blessing and the dominion, the Daniel 7 kingdom and dominion and power given to, he's the only one who has it coming. Now praise God, those who are washed cleaned up, purified, who are, who are sanctified, set apart because of the gospel work of this one and justified because of the gospel work of this one, all of them become joint heirs. And this is amazing. This is amazing. But John 17, Jesus even said, Father, make them one so that the world may know that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you loved me. That's what Jesus said. We don't deserve God's love and blessing. Jesus does. He is the inheritor and he has the right to inherit it, but in him we inherit it too. That's the second part. But look at this. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Tuesday night small group is named the joint heirs. That means they are joined with Christ in his being an inheritor of the kingdom and all the blessings thereof. Did you know that there are either there are heirs and there are non heirs? And that's what we're talking about here. Now he starts by saying, Do you not know? Now this is a this is a question that's calling attention to you ought to know. Is it possible that you don't know? You ought to know. And he says it in verse 2, in verse 3, in verse 9, in verse 15, in verse 19. Do you not know? James also used this in James chapter 4, verse 4. There, in fact, there's seven references to knowing that I counted in James he also says, do not be deceived. James does. It's used in James 1.16. And that's what, that's what Paul says here. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
Now, you need to hear this as there's no escape. Here's the future. You're not getting in if you're unrighteous. If we don't believe that, we will not appreciate the gospel. If we don't believe that, you're not getting in if you're unrighteous. Then there's really no good news. There's just news. If there's some other way to get in, then there's just suggestion and news. There are no commands to believe the gospel. But this question is, do you not know? It's a question that, is it possible that somehow you have missed this fundamental truth? The unrighteous. And remember, he used the same word, the wrongers, the wrongdoers, the ones who don't practice righteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he had just said, you're doing wrong. You're wronging each other. Self-deception. Do not be deceived. James calls it self-deception in James 1, 22 and 26. Now listen, here's something you need to understand. The future is hopeless and vain for those who are characterized by sin and rebellion against the righteous character of God. The future is hopeless and vain. In fact, it's terrible. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God as the judge. The law, even the entire word of God, establishes what is right and good against what is wrong and evil. If you don't believe that, you're not going to get any help here. The law and the entire word of God establishes what is right and good against what is wrong and evil. This is why we don't look inside to decide what's right and wrong. We look to the transcendent right and wrong established by the character of God. The reason our society is going the direction that we're going is because a, a specific conscience, conscious decision has been made by powers that be over the last hundred years or so that we're no longer going to think in terms of what's right and wrong is based on what is transcendentally right and wrong about the character of God. It's just going to be whatever we decide. That's the society we live in. That's why we're calling evil good and good evil. And that's why it's imperative that we understand what God says and not go by what does our society say. The future of the unrighteous is appropriate for the behavior of sinners. And they will not inherit the kingdom. They are not inheritors. And here's the idea. You can look in, uh, just, let's just turn over just so we can look at it right quick. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. This also helps us to see the, that the inheritance is the future. The inheritance of the future. Listen, if what we have right now is the inheritance, it's not very glorious. I mean, you know, I, I can have moments where I get my mind fixed on the glory of God and and these moments when I'm preaching and when I'm preparing to preach and I'm zeroed in. But this life is not an experience of that. It is an experience of life with moments of glory. Isaiah had a moment in Isaiah 6 unlike anything else in the rest of his life. And it was a moment. And then he went back to the task given to him. He had not inherited it yet. We have not inherited it yet. But praise God for the down payment. Look in 1 Corinthians 1, I mean Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of, of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Where was it promised? In, in the books of the Old Testament. Joel, for example. Isaiah. Who is the guarantee, that means earnest payment, down payment, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That's what's happening. And God is saying there's some people who are not going to inherit it. They don't have the Holy Spirit as a down payment because there's no inheritance for them. Flip over to Colossians 
1, 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, does, that sounds good, doesn't it? The inheritance of the saints in light. That is good and right and pure. But we have been qualified for it. Look at chapter 3 of Colossians. Colossians. Verses 23 and 24. Let's see, here's the future of the inheritance. It's, it's future. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now that's a, that's a strong command. It's, it's a difficult command. It's an easy one to let just kind of fly by. Yep. Yep. When I'm changing a tire, when I'm vacuuming in order to help my family members, when I'm showing up early for work at the request of my boss who thinks the Bible is a fairy tale, that all falls in the category of whatever you do, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Whatever you do. Doesn't say if you're preparing a sermon, do it heartily. If you're mowing the grass, just survive it, man. Just, just survive it. Doesn't say that, does it? Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Listen, I'm, I'm making a point of that to say this is now. This is now we can relate to that. We have not yet got the inheritance. We don't have the inheritance yet. And that's the reason that we're motivated to be able to obey that verse. Because look at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. Is there an inheritance? Yeah, there's an inheritance. All the promises of God promised to Israel and those grafted in, promised to the people of God, with the Jews at the foundation and Gentiles added so that God's salvation might extend to the ends of the earth. It's coming. It's coming. But the unrighteous will not inherit it. Now we've got a list here. This is the hard part. This is, uh, this is who we are outside of Christ. This is the human race. And we're told in the Thessalonian letters that if the Holy Spirit and the church were not present and God were not restraining evil, that this would characterize basically every moment of every day on earth. It's only by the grace of God that this list is not what you experience explicitly, always. But this is what's there. This is who we are outside of Christ. So we've got a list of the unrighteous. And these are people here. Because he's talking about unrighteous people who will not inherit. Other lists are the sins themselves. This one is a list of people. And it connects back with what he had said in chapter 5 up there. But let's, let's stick with chapter 6. Paul's list of the unrighteous includes those characterized with the following behavior. The sexually immoral. Now here's what I did. I, I looked up to understand so that we don't have a, a, an understanding of these words as toned down by our society. You know, we've been, we've been, we've had the idea of what's right and wrong in our society just just beaten onto us. What does God mean? What does it mean in God's word when we see sexually immoral? Now, I'm, I'm not going to go through and tell you all the Greek words just to pronounce the Greek words, but I do want you to understand what those words referred to in their original context. This word is pornoi, we get the word pornography from it. And it's not just sneaking off by yourself to look at something that you shouldn't look at. It's way more than that. It's all illicit 
sexual activity. It includes thought life, spoken words, and behavior. It's everything outside of God's plan for sexuality. And by the way, human sexuality was his idea, and it is good and right and pure according to his plan and purpose. But just like everything else, the devil, the flesh, the fallen, fallen world has said, let's, let's pervert it and twist it to our own preferences. Let's shake off commitment and just keep the pleasure part. That's what we're after. And so now people think that finding a partner has to do with finding a person who maybe has some common interest in this area and is not weirded out by what you think ought to be happening. It has nothing to do with serving other, the other person. It has nothing to do. So all of that, everything that is against God's plan for human sexuality would be included in that word, pornoi. And those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those people. This is one of those passages that help us to understand that the little cliches that get thrown around in church life, we might ought to rethink some of them. Like, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Listen, I understand that there's a truth that's trying to be communicated there. That's not a good way to say it. You know why, it's, why I say that? Because God's word explicitly says he's angry with the wicked all day long and he hates the wicked in Psalm 5. And here he is listing those who he excludes from the inheritance. At the top of the list, sexually moral. Idolaters. Now this is a... Uh, two words. Latria means service or worship. And idos means image. So this is an image worshiper. And you think, well, I've never put a, you know, I've never carved out a face on a rock, called it bota, and, you know, worshiped it. But in Romans 1, uh, we learn that the image is of the creature, whatever. However, the image is of the creature. If that is served, the creature instead of the creator. See, there's only one who's the creator. Service to anything else is idolatry. John Calvin famously said, our hearts are idol factories. We mass produce them. People outside of Christ who have not been washed, sanctified, and justified are zealous to serve and worship anything other than the true and living God. In our, in our wit witnessing over at the college campus, we have actually met a person who said that he worships Odin from the Avengers, uh, from Thor, from that mythology, and that he's hoping that Odin will find him worthy of the seventh uh, level or hall of honor of Valhalla. And Pastor David asked this young man, worthy based on what standard? And it appeared that he had never considered that before. And he thought for a minute and said, well, my mother, you know, kind of taught me right from wrong. That was an articulated religion to us, I'm trying to serve Odin based on the ethical standards that my mother taught me so I can make it to the seventh level of Valhalla. People worship, that's idolatry. Doesn't matter if he has actually physically got a picture or image of Odin. Now it emphasizes that in the word, image worship. Adulterers, moikoi, that's just exactly what it seems to be those who engage in a sexual relationship outside of marriage. But we also have in the ESV men who practice homosexuality. In verse, not verse, but there's a footnote here. Uh, number eight. The footnote in the ESV says, the two Greek terms translated by this phrase refer to the passive and active partners in consensual homosexual, uh, homosexual acts. 
So there are two words in the Greek behind this phrase, those men who practice homosexuality. And the two words are malakoi. And this has the idea of soft or effeminate. It was a technical term for the past, passive partner in homosexual relations. And then the other word is arsenikoitai, which included uh, in the language of that time kind of a slang word Male practice of homosexuality with a male is the idea. We have people saying today that the Bible teaches that marriage can be between a man and a man. But we have the explicit record of God in His Word right here. Those who do these things. It says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can believe the world or you can believe God. That's what God says. Nor thieves. Thieves. Uh, the word is klepti. We get the word kleptomaniac from that. Nor the greedy, greedy. Now see, in Baptist life, you can get a lot of amens on the same-sex marriage issue. But now we're moving into some other things. Thieves, those who take something that doesn't belong to them. You ever done that? You ever done that ever in your life? Thieves will not inherit the kingdom. And that means those who are characterized by that. Greedy. This is a word, uh, it, the root word uh, it includes the idea of filling up, filling up. The desire, it's one desires of having more and seeking to fulfill his desires through all means, one who covets. This is a person who knows what he wants and is out to get it. And by the way, that's celebrated in our society. Sports teams who win are celebrated. If it later comes out, well, it looks like they cheated a little bit. That's a footnote, but it's really not that big a deal because look at their drive and their ambition and what they accomplished. God says, you know what you want. You're going to get it at all costs. And it's not my glory. You're an idolater and you're greedy and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Think about a society rid of all this. The problem is we're all this. Outside of Christ. Drunkards. The idea here is the idea of addiction to vice, and it's connected with this next word, revilers. It's users of abusive language and, and, and abusing, being an abusive person, uh, one who tears down, one who uses shocking language or, or even language that has an, uh, an effect of bringing down. Swindlers. This is a rogue, a robber, a con artist, uh, uh, somebody who's out to get you and your stuff. Won't, won't inherit it. And that goes in, you know, most of these are up there in verse 5. Sexually immoral, uh, greedy, swindlers, idolaters. But I want you to, I want to give you just a few words from other lists in Scripture. I want to refer and give you at least some references so you can look. Because if you say in your heart, I care about right and wrong. If the next question is, what does the Bible say are examples of wrong and you don't know then I don't know that you're that big a champion of what's right and wrong. So you need to know where to go in Scripture to, to understand this. And here's what's at stake. Let me remind you again. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 23. This is going to happen in the future at the judgment. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And that's uh, anomia, against the law characterizes against or unconcerned with God's law. 
These are not people who went around saying we hate God. The people in that verse said, but we went around preaching and doing great and mighty works in your name. And he said, I never knew you. You are a worker of lawlessness. That means they went on their own idea of who Jesus is and what the message is and their version instead of the law of God. They were workers against the law or without the law. That's why I'm saying, if you say that you care about right and wrong, shouldn't you know what the Bible says about right and wrong? Because these people would tell you, we are so concerned with right and wrong. And then Jesus said, you're a worker against or without the law of God. That's scary. Better know this. What did Jesus say in Matthew 15, 19, and 20? Matthew 15, 19, and 20, he's talking about what defiles a man. Uh, he's being confronted with scribes there um, over his lack of, the disciples' lack of holding to their traditions. Uh, you can read that for context. But 19 and 20, Jesus said, Out of the heart, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, Sexual immorality, same thing. It's just instead of the person, it's the act now. Theft, false witness. And boy, that's a, that comes right from the Greek. Listen to this, pseudo martyria. Martyr, a martyr is one who is a witness who is killed. Pseudo, false. It's a false witness, one who's, who says, I'll tell you what happened, and it's not according to what happened. Slander. Blasphemii, and these, by the way, are all plural words, slanders. That speech that denigrates, defames, disrespects, insults, maligns. It is not related uh, to true or false report. It's, re it's related to the intention of the heart. And, but by the way, when it's false, it's even worse. Then it's false witness. The meaning of this word is behind the warning of presumptuous denouncement of the devil in Jude 8 through 10. This is important. This I, blasphemia in the Greek. Listen, the, let's look at this. Turn to Jude 8 to 10. The nonsense and silliness is not so silly that we see TV preachers and groups who are binding Satan and denouncing him and, and doing all manner of things that they say are, are defeating him. Well, what does the Bible say? Jude 8 to 10, he's talking about those who have crept in, who pervert the grace of God. This is how, what characterizes them. Verse 8, in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to, remount, to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. They are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them. Listen, we need to guard what we say. Even in the way we, re we give respect to angelic beings. If Michael the archangel did not presume to make a slanderous denouncement of the, of the devil, we need to think about how we talk about others. Even others who are wicked and vile. Now we are to call sin, sin. Okay? That's not what this is saying. But that motive to say, okay, what you're calling for is wrong in the eyes of God. That's a good motive. Here's what's not a good motive. I can't stand that guy. That guy's the devil. We need to be careful and understand what the motives of our heart are. And our own perspective. Our own perspective is limited and imperfect always, right? 
And then Jesus said, these are what defile a person. To eat with unwise hands does not defile anyone. That's what they were on him about. How is it that you're ignoring what we've come up with? No, that doesn't do it. Let's look at, uh, let's look at one more list. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. 19 to 21. We'll just go through these. And then I might uh, give you some highlights of another. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. This is, these are the works of the flesh. And just like with 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, there's a contrast. And then you get the fruit of the Spirit. Works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of angers, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, we need to have a compassion for the people who are involved in these sort of things, not so that we can live in the America that we like to live in, but so they will be warned and understand if you live like this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This place is temporary and perishing, but the kingdom that Jesus will establish will be glorious and will the benefits and blessings for the church will last into eternity the eternal state a couple of ideas here you see pornaya again sexual immorality every kind of sexual sin impurity what is that it's uncleanness and filthiness in a spiritual and moral sense sensuality what is this it's unrestrained living, unbridled acts of indecency which shock the public. Movies are made and make lots of money for their shock value. People say shock value, don't pursue that. that this has to do with that. Don't try to shock people with your indecent ideas and speech. Sorcery, now this is interesting, Pharmaka pharmakia. We get the word pharmacy from it. It's not wrong to take medicine. Okay? This is the use of drugs for magical purposes and magic. Enmity. This is hostility, ill will, hatred, strife. This is selfish rivalry. Jealousy. This is zealous. This is zeal. It's intense feelings for someone or something. Listen, this is very important. Either positive or negative either positive or negative. When God is a jealous God, He's not doing something that's sinful. But here it seems to be coordinate with the word strife in the sense of rivalry or party attachment. And that's exactly what Paul is dealing with in Corinthians. Fits of anger. Burning anger with, which flares up and burns with the intensity of fire. Are you characterized by that? You talk about something that's important to you? Are you characterized by fits of anger, burning, fire, fury? You can't control yourself? That's on the list of those who do not inherit the kingdom of God. What's the fruit of the Spirit? The last one, self-control. Dissensions just means division. The English word dichotomy comes from this word. Divisions. Really, it means heresies, but the meaning reflects factions. It's the result of the former divisions organized into factions and cliques. That's exactly what happened in Corinth. They separated, they, they divided in two, or in that case, four examples from Paul, and they had factions over it. Carous the, the word for orgies is uh, komoi, carousing. Drinking party is in a pagan festival of Bacchus or Dionysius, the Roman and Greek names of those gods. Things like these, things like these. How do we apply that? Romans 14, 23 says, Every, whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Do you hear that? Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Here's another list that you should that you should 
read Ephesians 5, 1 to 7. I do want to give you a couple. One on that list is foolish talk. Moralagia, the talk of fools. Foolishness and sinfulness are brought together aiming at a mere laugh that doesn't even include wit. It's just low, debase, fool talk. Crude joking. Now this is, our society doesn't quite hear this the same way as the first century society because for listen to this, this implies, this is from uh, Rogers and Rogers, uh, which is a great source, uh, and, and also the, the Greek uh, lexicon of New Testament and early Christian writing. BDAG is the abbreviation because of the German names that make up B, D, A, and G. Rogers and Rogers said this word, this coarse jesting or crude joking, implies the dexterity of turning a discourse to wit or humor that ends in deceptive speech, so formed that the speaker easily contrives to wriggle out of its meaning or engagement. This is like a, like a little bit of a double entendre, like a person who's really good at just kind of casting a little, a little thought towards something that's illicit. But if somebody said, did you say that? Oh, I didn't think of that. This is the person who cleverly tries to, to just throw that, just to show kind of a knowing glance with people who get it. Not going to inherit the kingdom. Colossians 3, 1 to 8, same, same thing, a list right there. There are lists in Romans 1, 29 to 31. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. Revelation 21, 8. And 22, 15. And what I want to do in conclusion is read that one. So look at Revelation 22. We read it earlier. We're going to read this first and then we're going to read verse 11 again because I got to read that one to, rem to, to remember the good news. Revelation 22, 15. Outside. Outside. We get the glorious vision of the new Jerusalem. And Jesus says, outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. The unrighteous, do you, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But, praise God for that, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I look forward to unpacking that verse and understanding what that says, but before we leave today, if there's anyone here whose life is characterized by these things that we've looked at, and we scratch the surface, oh, we scratch the surface. I've got another page or so up here of details of what these words mean, helping us to understand what these words are. I think we get the picture. And the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this characterizes who you are, and it does, unless the Holy Spirit has changed your heart, you're not going to heaven. You'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. You'll be outside. But praise God. Jesus has done everything necessary to redeem a people for himself. And if you say, I recognize my sin, I repent of it, I don't want to be outside. For God's glory, I come to him. Well, I'll be up here briefly after we conclude. Come talk to me. We'll talk about that. Or go to the Welcome Center. Or see Pastor David. But don't leave in that condition and not knowing what to do about it. Faith in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, that's our hope. And that's how we get washed, sanctified, and justified. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word.
Thank you for telling us the truth. Thank you for telling us how extensive and terrible the bad news is and how wonderful and freeing and delivering the good news is. Lord, help us to live appropriately for those who are washed and sanctified and justified because we do have your name. And I pray that it will be a, our lives will be pleasing to you as we live out grace that you've given. In Jesus' name, amen.